Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you're coming from. Welcome to CG HG webinar 274. My name is David Mills. And I'm, I'm, I'm in these really sad moments and times. Uh, we're going to take a little bit of just uh, uh, our thoughts away to um, a really interesting topic today. We have a home team presenting um, Lily Yang, um, Simon Rajinson, and Chin Shu, all from um, my department of education um, here in Oxford, are going to be talking about thinking through Tianxia, a new old heuristic for worldwide higher education. And they've been working on this for a while. I think it's a really interesting topic for thinking about how we might reconceptualize um, higher education relations worldwide. A few bit of housekeeping as normal, you'll know the rules here. This is being recorded today. Um, and so please um, remember that, um, that there'll be a, a transcript will be posted online and the recording will be also made available. And um, please keep yourself muted unless you've been asked to speak um, or, and you don't need to keep your video on. Um, do speak of you, it's helpful to see what's going on, and then use the chat function to ask questions. And then after about half an hour or so, when our three presenters have finished talking, um, I'll, I'll um, sort of convene the questions and I invite you to put your video on and, and speak. Um, and with that, I'll hand over to Lily. I'm looking forward very much to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, um, depending on where you are. Thank you for coming to our webinar, in which we'll discuss and introduce the idea of Tianxia, All Under Heaven, originally a Chinese concept, and discuss a Tianxia heuristic for rethinking global higher education. Tianxia includes all of higher education and all human knowledge. Unlike a nation or an empire, Tianxia has no outer boundary, no self-other dualism, this may make Tianxia especially relevant at a time when globalization and geopolitics has brought us closer than ever, so that our worldwide similarities and our differences are now obvious to us. Globalization is not everything, um, but it has changed everything, including higher education. The last 30 years has seen great growth of cross-border activities in higher education. A network global science system has emerged international student mobility has expanded. There is continuous expansion in university partnerships and consortia, branch campuses, global hubs in higher education, and online delivery such as MOOCs. Higher education institutions and scientists everywhere are embedded in nation states while also being active in global relations and at the level of the world as a whole. However, the term international, meaning international between nations does not capture this. How then can we conceive the world as a whole, as a positive environment for all within it? How can we conceive global or worldwide higher education in a less pejorative, less limiting, more inclusive and more equitable manner than is suggested by the practice of global market, global ranking, white supremacy or Anglo-American knowledge hierarchy. What is the actual world and what is the possible world? It's a compelling problem. Well, today we we'll argue that the Tianxia idea provides a possible approach to that. And I will now invite Simon to speak about our open ontology. Well, we'll now briefly indicate our philosophical stance in this paper. Um, now the key is open ontology. Uh, First, we argue that natural and social reality exist independently of our perceptions of them, but our interpretations and our social practices are among the elements that constitute the real. Reality is not fixed, but it's continually changing, emergent. It is not being, but it is becoming. There are many possibilities and the possible is part of the real. Because our world is constantly changing and, and becoming more globalized, as Lily said, we need global governance to come onto the agenda. But our perceptions are currently blocked. Our interpretations, our old habits, our old ways of seeing are stopping us from working on the global governance problem. New slide, please. Secondly, we position ourselves between the particularity of the universal 
and the universality of the particular. We're wary of universalistic claims to no totality and also wary of the kind of universal particular dualism in which some particular values are elevated to the level of universal, while other particulars are seen as just particular, even as outside or barbarian. In relation to Qian's three kinds of universalism, the third one offers a way forward. This is the universality that acknowledges and respects the other. Mutual recognition, actively seeking dialogue and where possible consensus. The Chinese concept of Hie e Bouton, unity of diversity or harmony with diversity, speaks to the reconciliation between different positionalities. We acknowledge the geocultural particularity, the Chinese-ness of the Qianxia idea. We also see the potential of Qianxia to move beyond the Chinese sphere, addressing universal questions about the world. I now pass back to Lily. Thank you very much, Simon. I will then discuss the concept of Tianxia and its different strengths and debates. Ancient China was the source of two key ideas about the spatial governance of human societies. The older idea, the focus of today, was that of Tianxia, thinking on the basis of the world as a whole and the governance of the world on the basis of consensual value. This was part of the Western Zhou Dynasty and the mode of statecraft in China until the Qing Dynasty. The younger idea was the centrally ordered nation state. The Qing dynasty state was the first nation state of a recognizably modern kind. In China, it replaced the politics of the world with the politics of the nation. However, despite the emergence of the Qing nation state, the Tianxia idea has continued as a strand in Chinese thinking and writings, especially in international relations. Thinking through the nation and thinking through the world coexist in China. At times, they are brought into an explicit relationship. Tianxia is the specific ontological approach to the world and all relations within the world. Its Chinese characters are Tian, literally meaning as sky, heaven, nature, God, and Xia, literally meaning as under, below, down. In Chinese tradition, Tian can both refer to the material and natural heaven from Chinese people's observation of sky or a supernatural heaven associated with notions of worship. Combined, the phrase Tianxia means all under heaven. Tianxia is an evolving and living concept. It's open to multiple uses and interpretations. Stemming from the idea Tian, heaven, Tianxia first emerged as an ecological imagining of all human beings and creatures on earth. It was an early construction of the world imagination based on the observations, experiences, and imaginations of Chinese people at the time. In this imagination, China or the central plain in Northern China was the center of Tianxia. The concept of Tianxia then developed from this geographical and spatial imagination becoming a cultural constitution and understanding of the world order. While some Chinese thinker view the world as transcending ethnicity and geographical location, reflecting a civilizational imagination of the world, they highlighted the commonness of human beings and downplayed the emphasis of China at the center of Tianxia. Ideas such as one Tianxia, yi Tianxia, and all under heaven are one family, Tianxia yi jia were stressed. In contrast, some other people, um, some other thinkers focused on establishing a rigid and explicit hierarchical structure among groups of people inhabiting the Tianxia space. They centered around a political structuring of Tianxia rather than Tianxia as a civilizational sphere, highlighting a hierarchical order between Xia, broadly referring to Chinese Han ethnicity, and Yi, broadly referring to non-Han ethnicity. As this suggests, the meaning of Tianxia are multi-layered. For example, Yang and Chen reveal that Tianxia has at least 11 meanings in preaching era. In an attempt to summarize the multiple meanings of Tianxia, 
Zhao Qingyang finds the classic concept of Tianxia primarily has three meanings or dimensions that are geographical, psychological, and moral or political. Gan Chunsong points to three facets of the classic idea of Tianxia. One is geographically speaking, Tianxia means all areas under heaven or within the four seas, Si Hai Zhi Mei. Secondly, Tianxia refers to order of governance. Thirdly, Tianxia points to the recognition of the values underlying the order. Some scholars distinguish between Tianxia as a normative appeal and Tianxia in real polity. Wang Ban argues that the Tianxia idea is simultaneously embodied as a way of knowing the world and as a set of normative propositions in dealing with institutions in the world. Wang Ban's arguments are echoed by Xu Zilin, who sees classic idea of Tianxia as having two closely related meanings. One refers to the universal order containing a set of cosmic values. The other is associated with governance and order in real politics in an imagined space, following universal order and with the objective of reaching the great harmony, Da Tong. It remains unclear to what extent these principles were implemented in real politics. It has also been argued that in imperial China, the practice of Qian Xia has led to a hierarchical system of world order, and the contemporary application of Qian Xia idea may result in a new global empire or hegemon that replaces the existing one. In the classic Qian Xia idea, particularly when it's applied with geographical references, certain civilizations and regimes are placed as centers while others are affiliated or peripheral. Despite the emphasis on all under heaven being one family, there was an assumption of unequal relationships between different groups of people in Tianxia, with the Han civilization being in the center. And Xin will explore these ideas further in a minute. Well, at the core, at the core of Tianxia are virtues. Confucius states that, Governance based on virtue is like the North Star taking its place in the sky while all the other stars revolve around it. De, meaning virtue, is an essential notion in the Chinese thinking about governance. It also reflects the Chinese approaches to expanding the impact within and beyond its borders. For example, an important reason for the Zhou dynasty's success in overturning the previous dynasty, Shang dynasty, and its long continuation after that was its regime grounded in virtue. Following the idea of virtue, the Zhou people protected and respected the Shang people's properties, original lifestyles and religions. The only requirement made of the Shang people was that they accept the Zhou regime. The original Zhou kingdom included only 50,000 to 70,000 people but the Shang political center in the central plain had a million or more. But Zhou had the moral authority to use the small to govern the great. It developed an institution order that did not rely solely on military threat for governance. This was based on consensus about shared va values, rituals, and benefits. These values encompass inclusion, respect for diversity, mutuality and respect for others, and governance based on the consent of people. These values were practiced to varying degrees, even in relation with neighboring kingdoms. However, virtue alone was not enough. Meeting shared interests and maintaining security and stability of the regime were also important conditions of the Zhou governance. So the Zhou dynasty began to falter when it no longer had the surplus land to distribute in exchange for virtuous conduct. I will then hand over to Xin. Thank you very much, Lily and Simon. So continuing the discussions about Tianxia, another really important strand of the interpretation is entangled with modern nationalism, China and the world. Firstly, there have been conflicting views about the relationship between Tianxia and nationalism. So when the idea of nationalism and modern nation states was first introduced to China in the 19th century, some intellectuals began to see the Tianxia idea as related to the Chinese imperial imagination of the world relations and as causing China's weakness. In contrast, Sun Zhongshan or Sun Yat-sen 
saw nationalism and Pinsa as not in conflict. As he explained, if we're going to bring peace and harmony to Tianxia in future, we first need to restore nationalism and the status of our nation to use our inherent mor morality centering around peace as foundation to bring the great harmony to the world. And this is the true spirit of our nationalism. And con contemporary work on Tianxia sits between two sets of notions, the Tianxia-centered notions and the world-centered notions. The former discusses Tianxia, where China plays a significant role, while the latter imagines the world as a whole that do not presume one center or China being the center. So firstly, about the China-centered notions. Zhao Tingyang's work on Tianxia, which have been highly influential in the contemporary discussions, see the reinterpretation of the Tianxia idea as part of the movement of rethinking China, meaning Zhongguo. The movement inspires China to rebuild its own values, methodologies, and frameworks, and rethink about itself and the world. And to some, Tianxia is a way for China to establish its own discourses and soft power, such as in relation to the Belt and Road Initiative. Nonetheless, scholars like Ge Zhao Guang suggested that since China centeredness and the center periphery distinction were intrinsic to the Tianxia in Imperial China, there's a danger of China claiming the Tianxia idea, which is a true nationalism as a new cosmopolitanism. And Callahan also sees Tianxia not as a regime of culture or an authority, but a projection of a global hegemon. Uh, Callahan also expresses concerns about China's pressure on other smaller countries and the potential danger of forming a new center periphery system, as also discussed in the previous part by Lily. And in turn, the critiques of China Center Tianxia have inspired attempts by scholars to reinterpret a world centered Tianxia. For instance, Liu Qing suggested to reject the illusion of returning to the past Chinese empire and thrive to save the ideas of the world from the disillusionment of China centrism, while inherent and reinterpret certain ideas embodied in the idea of Tianxia. Liu Xing also argues that in the reinterpretation of Tianxia, it is possible for win-win cooperation, mutual exchanges, and a sense of universalism derived from continuous dialogues between cultures. The Tianxia ideas appears to her Butong, unity grounded in harmonious cosmopolitanism. It is believed that the universality can be achieved through mutual respect and dialogue. And here, universality and particularity coexist under Tianxia. And common to all the discussions about Tianxia highlights uh, the commonness shared by humanity and the human beings' belongings to the community. It also challenges the often Western dualistic worldview, which focuses on transforming, assimilating, or eliminating, quote unquote, the other, in order to mitigate the tensions between I and others. An important perspective about Tianxia, based on Zhao Tingyang, is thinking through the world. A contrasting notion is thinking of the world. In the later term, the world is understood as an object rather than a subject in its own right. When thinking through the world, however, the world becomes a single entity with subcollective agents. And the national identity of the individual is secondary to becoming a member of Tianxia. To think through the world, break through the national containers, pave the way for discussions about global world, world citizenship and consolidate human beings' responsibility to both serve the world and prioritize the good of the world rather than other interests. And so what is the relationship between Tianxia and global higher education and research? Although there have been vibrant discussions about globalization in higher education scholarships, and although Tianxia offers a distinctive and culturally significant lens to these discussions, 
there has been only a small number of relevant studies so far about Tianxia and higher education. Some of them focused on Tianxia in Chinese higher education, others are having a global scope. For instance, Yang Rui examines the pa paradoxes within Chinese epistemology of Tianxia, and he suggests that Tianxia concept is a heuristic key to unlocking the paradoxical internationalization of Chinese higher education. This perspective has influenced our paper today. Our colleague here today, Li Li Yang, and also Tian Lin, reviewed a range of scholarships on Tianxia in Chinese and English languages, and they discussed its relation to higher education. Another paper is comparing the Anglo-American and Chinese approaches to the uh, public dimension of activity in higher education. Li Li Yang also, uh, suggests that Tianxia Wei Gong, meaning all under heaven belongs to all and is for all, is an alternative to the Western notion of global common, common good or global public good. So how do we move forward with the Tianxia discussion, especially in global higher education? We argue that the Tianxia ideas offers a way to escape the national container in higher education. There are multiple scales in higher education and science at the intersections between materiality, imagination, interpretation, and social practices, such as a glonaco heuristic proposed by margins and roles. Despite the understandings of multiple scales, as Shatterham and Kenz have argued, perception and empirical research are often trapped within national container and framed by methodological nationalism. And Tianxia is distinct from the global scale. While the global refers solely to the phenomena and activities that constitute worldwide relationships, Tianxia includes all the different scales at the same time as in the global idea. And higher education in Tianxia includes all of the global systems and activities and agents. It also entails the values and relationships. Tianxia is both a goal to be achieved and something that is real. Its reality combines the actual and the possible. It both reflects and shapes behaviors. So to sum up, we see Tianxia functioning as a description of existing social relations, a mode of interpreting social relations, an ideal form of social relations, and also a call to practice the ideal. And therefore, we propose Tianxia as a heuristic or lens for understanding, interpreting, and shaping the materiality discourses and dynamics of global higher education and research. Arguably, due to the self-regulated nature of higher education research, a Tianxia order is more readily practiced in higher education than in the political and economic orders. And there are seven elements in the Tianxia heuristic. First and foremost, thinking through the world. This imagines the higher education knowledge world as a single networked and interdependent collective subject within the space without borders. And Tianxia higher education knowledge moved to internalize all kinds of institutions and all kinds of knowledge. In Tianxia, there's neither externality nor binaries. And second then, the Tianxia higher education heuristic highlights connectivity and the collaborative Tianxia as one family, Tianxia Yijia, and the need to establish a world government um, and the world system of institutions that endorse the pursuit of this idea. And third, as Simon also suggested, Her Butong, which entails both universality and diversity. It suggests both inclusive cosmopolitan populations of students and faculty and staff, and also a radical opening up to include all human knowledge and all variety of institutions. And fourth, as in the classical Tianxia, the Tianxia higher education heuristic is also shaped by tensions between equality and hierarchy. Although hierarchies exist in the Tianxia higher education world, they are not necessarily structurally closed. Material hierarchies should not be separate should be separated from the hierarchies of values. And the vital questions to ask 
include who to decide which value order to follow and how to leave the hierarchies open for changes to equality, equity, and justice. And fifth, the active consent of the participants in higher education. This is achievable as higher education space is a people-intensive social sector that rely on sociability, groups, conversations, and communications. And six, the inclusion of nature, ecological thinking, and sustainability frameworks. This follows not only from the classical Tianxia's preoccupation with nature, but also the understanding of the world as a collective subject, and also the discussions about the role of higher education in promoting and facilitating ecologically sustainable futures. And finally, the role of the ratio, which plays a key role in fostering affective commitment and the sense of belonging in higher education and research. Examples of ratios um, include academic degrees, credentials, ceremonies, and also peer review in research. I'll now hand, hand back to Simon. Thanks, Jin, and thanks, Lily. Um, now, we've said that a world-centered Tianxia heuristic involves several elements, thinking through the world and ecology and sustainability, relationality and connectivity, which means more specifically, willing participation without coercion and active consent, he'e bouton, or unity and diversity, and rituals enabling the affect and practice of belonging. It also has both horizontal and vertical dimensions and self-evidently operates to the benefit of all. What could it mean to create a mode of global governance in higher education, enabling voluntary collaboration across the world, grounded in virtuous practice, in a world where there is no outer boundary, a world in which difference and diversity are how we learn, and there is no abyss between the self and the other, no exclusion of elements outside the boundary. We suggest eight such practices, and they're listed in this slide. These virtues of a world-centered Jiangxia already attract and hold people in higher education, though they're not consistently practiced in global relations. The core values of a Jiangxia order include academic freedom, truth-seeking and truth-telling, and the norms of academic conduct. Core practices like academic freedom differ in the nuance from country to country. In Anglo-American settings, the primary emphasis is on negative freedom, freedom from external constraint or coercion. In China, academic freedom is primarily understood in positive terms, freedom to do, in conjunction with high status public responsibilities. There are also important commonalities across the world in relation to academic freedom. In both the Chinese case and the Anglo-American case, faculty and students value autonomy in teaching and research. No one wants to be told what to think or to program others. We believe that these eight principles could become shared values of a Chanxia order in higher education and knowledge. Joe's point about exemplars of success must also apply. What pragmatic factors would hold in place a Chanxia order? Well, there's a shared interest in the mutual status that's formed through collaborative international activities in which each party augments the status of the other. And there are positive sum benefits in information exchange, international education, and especially combined knowledge building. Science and scholarship are inherently relational with a natural Jiangxia form. This is why cross-border science is expanding rapidly. It is true that at present in global higher education, this natural Jiangxia form is overdetermined by inequitable power. Status and knowledge are partly closed, partly privatized and highly stratified 
structured by nation states and calibrated by neoliberal competition and rankings. In contrast, in the Tian Xia order, knowledge is shared and accumulates. A worldwide Tian Xia order in higher education, grounded in mutual respect and learning through diversity, can realize much greater total benefits with these benefits accessed by all on an inclusive basis. Thank you very much for listening. I want to pay tribute to my colleagues uh, for their great work. It's been a pleasure working with them on this paper and might mention that Lily is now at Hong Kong University. So this is a, an international collaboration. Lily, Shin, Simon, that's brilliant, absolutely brilliant today. At the moment where we're geopolitics in Europe, at least, are looking very sad and grim. And um, you know, you offer us a, a vision of a of a of a of a world that that possibly could begin to think more harmoniously. Um, and you've given us, uh, I think, a, a, you know, a rich history of of the concept. You've been honest about about the challenges and. Um, you know, you've, you've acknowledged that the, the, the challenges that some have posed to the concept um, of, of either romanticizing um, a, a certain moment in Chinese history or the challenge of, and I, for me, I'd be interested in asking more about this, the, the challenge of the relationship between the concept and um, its, its use within Chinese IR, international relations, but, but we can come back to that. For now, I'm going to open the floor up and um, I would very much welcome um, comments, thoughts, and responses. Um, and I'm going to ask Jun Li, if, 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 who has put their a question in the chat first, whether they'd like to come forward and, and ask it, please. Oh, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. And I have taped the question with the text. And my question is, Tianxia is a very good concept, uh, also very interesting concept. And, also potential to resolve the conflicts in today's society. However, you know, in Chinese culture, there are many parallel concepts like a mode of differentiation proposed by the late professor Fei Xiaotong, right? And this, this value also stressed the hierarchy in social relations or what we know as guanxi. And that is when the conflicts emerge, Chinese tend to take care of those who have closer relationship with them. And then how can we truly achieve Tianxia Yijia? Because there is the hierarchy in the social relations and how can we resolve such conflicts when there are so many parallel values like Tianxia Yijia while we have the mode of differentiation? Thank you very much. Who wants to take that first? Maybe I could start with um, um, to briefly uh, to talk about what has been discussed in the literature, because um, I, I thank you very much for the question. This is a key question that has been a core uh, at the center of the, the scholar discussion in relation to the idea and concept of Tianxia. Um, so uh, a lot of scholars that are cr um, critiquing the idea of Tianxia saying that is hierarchical in nature. And um, this is definitely um, in relation with what we have talk, how you have talked about the Chinese tradition of the tendency to um, take care of um, the, those that are, have closer relationship with them. But there has been a lot of discussion in terms of how we can de-hierarchicalize um, of the relationship in Tianxia. And there has been long um, discussing relationships, so uh, discussing uh, discussions, for example, uh, why are we promote the idea of equality? Um, because we are now clearly aware of this hierarchical um, problem in the concept of traditional idea of Tianxia. Um, in, in higher education, this is perhaps more likely to be achieved than other, for example, po political or economic orders because in higher education, we emphasize um, equal partnerships, we emphasize harmony, we emphasize um, joint and collaborative work. So that is um, why we argue that higher education might be 
a setting where this idea of Tianxia can be um, can play out in reality. So, any other um, do do you want to add uh, Samuel and Xin? I'll let Xin go first, but I'll, I'll say something. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Professor D. I think that's a really, really important question. And as we also argued in our explanation, that we think the Tianxia idea is like in the Tianxia idea, the hierarchies and equality coexist. Um, so there's a possibility that there are hierarchies, but but we also see that the hierarchies, and also as argued in the previous scholarship, that the hierarchies are not necessarily structurally closed. So um, Guanxi is important, hierarchical objects are important. However, there might be changes uh, to break through or to find alternative ways of like reordering or, or to move forward from this. And I, I'm not sure if Simon has more points to mm. at this point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, th I think that, that this is, you know, a really important discussion. There's actually more than one discussion in it. One is the discussion about hierarchy and, and if you like, kind of flat relationships in an inclusive order, universal order. The other one is about this question about primary loyalties and, uh, and, 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 and they're not quite the same question. Um, I want to just talk about the second one. Um, I would say that firstly, in both traditional Chinese thinking and in any society, uh, multiple relations and multiple loyalties have been part of the social fabric and are normal, if you like. I mean, we all have orientations to our families. Often we have orientations to a local community. We have orientations to a larger political framework and we have orientations to the world as a whole. And this is a kind of age old human problem about how you configure these different um, loyalties or commitments. But the sort of Amartya Sen point, I think is right that plurality of association and loyalty is a sort of normal fact. So, and, and, and it doesn't negate the possibility of a worldwide relational order. You know, the fact that you have these more localized connections. Um, but I'd say that the Qianxia idea which we're advancing goes beyond simply inclusion. You know, it goes beyond the idea of everyone being in a relational setting together uh, and acknowledging the right to diversity, if you like, the right to difference. I think it goes further than that. And it says difference is positive. Difference is how we learn. Difference is how we understand ourselves better. Through the lens of someone else's eyes, we can start to see the world in a different way. And by seeing that world in a different way, as well as the way we're used to, we can start to understand the relational setting that we're in with others. Uh, and so it's more than liberal cosmopolitanism. You know, it's, it's saying that difference is a really, a really positive thing in the world. Um, and maybe often the way forward is to engage with the other, to embrace the other, if you like, through, through acknowledgement of this positive aspect in the relational environment of the role of difference. Maybe we've got a lot to learn from each other. We don't, any of us, have all the answers to these enormous global problems that we're now facing. You know about the current problem in Ukraine, but of course, environmental sustainability. This can be approached in so many different ways. There's so much wisdom to bring to this problem. We need to listen to the other. Thanks, Simon. That's a heartfelt existential cry, but also one that is grounded in, in, in a deep ethical um, ontology of, of um, Lebanesian respect for the other. So I'm going to go on and um, Yusuf and or even Dr. Oldek, you have a, a question which carries on this question around the relationship between Tiangsha as a, as, a, as a model of the world. Please, it's yours. Thank you very much. So I'd like to thank the presenters about this, you know, really great presentation, like very, very nice to learn new things always. My question is, how is the Tiangsha imaginary uh, different from the quote unquote Western take on this and, you know, the, gl the global imaginary, let's say, would you highlight key differences if we want to have a comparative look? Of course, I'd like to acknowledge that, you know, there may not be a coherent quote unquote Western imaginary, imaginary on this, but I'd like to get your opinions on this. Thank you very much. 
Great. I mean, I, I, I just just build on that, Yusuf. I think that perhaps the Western take it. I mean, you know, obviously, you could critique all sorts of Western takes, but I'd be interested to know how you see it relate also to 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 a UNESCO style vision of internationalism in, in education, because that would be a, an attempt at another global imaginary as well, wouldn't it? Anyway, I don't know who wants to start. Lily, of course. Yeah, our leader. Well, no, thank you, Simon. So. Um... I think this is a great question, and I totally agree with you, Yusuf, that there isn't one single uh, interpretation of the Western style, of, uh, Western interpretation of global. Well, uh, I think one of the primary or dominant approach to the global today, global imaginary today, is the methodological nationalism. And then we see the world, we see the globe global through the lens of nation states, and that is how we understand uh, higher education activities to a certain extent, and many other, for example, international relations, and also economic activities, and we see the world through the lens of states, nation states, and there is a zero sum relationship between the uh, nation states. So that is what um, the Tianxia idea, and we are criti critiquing here, that we try to go beyond these um, looking through the nation state's view, but try to see the world as a whole. It's, um, it's, ha it has its value, its intrinsic value, um, its own right as a one entity. And when we see it as one collective entity, all, the, all of the other sub entities are, un are, are, beneath, are beneath that, under that, then for example, the good of the world, good of Tianxia becomes a priority uh, rather than um, any parochial or provincial um, benefits or goods. So that is um, one important di dimension of uh, understanding this um, Tianxia and how it's different from one of the dominant um, views today. Perhaps Xin and Simon want to add on that. Um, thank you, Lily. I think that's that's really comprehensive already. The, just to follow up about the so-called Western <laughs> discussions, um, in some sense, the Tianxia ideas also have the implications and also discussions about some of the uh, discussions that are also held in West, in the West. For instance, the ideas of the ecologies of knowledges, the diversity um, and, and justice of knowledge of epistemological, like diversity and inclusion. Those ideas are not like completely new in terms of the Chinese Tianxi idea. So those are some like corresponding ideas also coexist in different strands of scholarships. To, to add and to also to pick up David's point, um, I would say that Yusuf, the, you know, the global is not particularly necessarily a term that's it's Western. I mean, globalization in the way that it's evolved as a sort of ideology is certainly a Western notion. But, you know, the global is just uh, the worldwide uh, relationship, uh, like saying global ecology, you know, it's not particularly the property of the West. Um, but the difference with the Tianxiao idea is it contains the world level, but it, it, but it also contains the national and local and the regional and so on. So it's, it's about the way the whole thing happens. The whole thing relates everything, all the scales, you know, all the different scales, not just the global scale, but the national and local and, and regional as well. Secondly, I suppose in relation to the question of contrast with the Western view, I mean, you know, the sort of... The downside of the Western view is what what um, Shin talked about. You know this notion that um, the relationship between self and other is approached by se se seeking to suppress the other or make the other the same as the self. So that you know you have, for example, this kind of American, mainstream American foreign policy view that was good to relate to China for thirty years because China would become more Western, more like us, more like an American style democracy. Uh, and, and a liberal American economy. You know, and those two things necessarily went together and so on. Um, and when, you know, there was this quite late realization that China wasn't going to become culturally transformed and become westernized progressively, uh, it was going to remain quite distinct uh, and cynic uh, and would adopt some, but not all of the mo Western modern ideas. Um, uh, then there was this, this disengagement, you know, so we can't make it like us. So we're not going to, we're going to push it out into the outer boundary beyond the acceptable world. We're going to create a world of inside our relationships, our friends, and a world outside, which is China. Um, you know that that that's that's very different to the Jiangxia approach. Um, 
On, and I think UNESCO is heading in the same direction in a lot of ways to Chanxia. Um, the global common good idea in education, very similar in lots of ways. It's responding to a different tradition. It's responding to, I think, the West European democratic tradition, the communal democracy of, say, northern Italian cities, um, and the way they also relate to each other. Um, it's uh, you know picking up the idea of, of the participative democracy is an end in itself, but it's also a means whereby you establish a notion of what's to everyone's benefit or what's of common value. Um, and you know the emphasis is on governance. That's the participatory people deciding what they want what their objectives are and so on. So I, I think a chance our idea has a lot of that, you know, but it probably doesn't go as far in spelling out the governance aspects at local level. So I think there's something there to think about. There's something to be drawn into the Chancia idea from the Western democratic, participatory democratic idea that UNESCO in a quite far-sighted way was able to pick up and, 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 uh, and, and broadcast quite widely. Great, thank you. That's really comprehensive and helpful. Um, lots of questions still coming in. Thank you, everyone, for contributing. Yachiao, would you like to come in with your question, please? Yeah, thank you so much for your fruitful information. I have typed down my question in the chat box also. So I want to ask the possibilities of using Tianxia as a theoretical framework. Um, in, our in empirical studies when we research mm. internationalization of higher education. I, I do can see some limitations of using Western theory when we research internationalization of Chinese context. So I really want to say like how we can de develop Tianxia in empirical studies. So that I think the um, Tianxia is a theory that de derived from Eastern context. And so probably I can say like there is a huge possibility of developing Tianxia so that we can see the um, theory from Eastern embarrass the theory from Western. Thank you so much. I hope I clarify my question. I'm a little nervous. Thank you. Sorry, uh, who would like to start? Lily, go off you. I think Sam and need to go first with this. He has been, he has a lot of things to share. That's fine. Well, I, mean, I think Shin could answer it too. Um, the, I mean, but you know, but clearly you need to. I mean, yes, you can. I mean, think of the ways that 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 Shin talked about. You know, the different meanings of uh, Chan Chao, the different ways it can work, and one of the ways it can work is as a conceptual framework for empirical work. I mean, that's that's clear. So you would need to establish then what we mean by Chan Chao. You know, what what relational aspects, what forms of behaviour, kinds of relationships. Um, you would fit under the heading of Chanxia um, order or Chanxia relation. Uh, and then you would look to find those, you know, evidence of those or absence of those forms of behaviour in uh, international relations in higher education. And of course, it you know, wouldn't just be useful for China unless we see, I guess what we're working with is a world-centred notion of Chanxia. That's really quite, I mean, that's going to be pretty important, I think. That we hold to that in advancing the Chanxia concept, because if it's nation state centered, it won't, you know, if it's, if you like, uh, it reflects the, the synthesis of the of a, of a, of a Qin dynasty and, and Jiao dynasty view, it won't quite work, you know, at a world level. Uh, and it's quite important to hang on to the, the world notion, the world centered notion, version of Chanxia. So if that's the case, then it wouldn't just be useful in analyzing China, you know, it'd be useful in analyzing international student mobility internationalization of the curriculum, you know, in any national context. Okay, does that answer your question, Joe? Um, anyone else wants to join in there? Thank uh, you. Good, okay, brilliant. Um, I might come back to that, but, but let's go on. There's a couple, several questions. Uh, Elisa, would you like to come in, please? Hello. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation and for your bravery in putting forward the eight core values. It was it was fantastic to see your response to this thinking. My question is about practical examples. Um, can you mention some examples of research or teaching and practice that embody the eight core values you propose? Um, you already talked about the challenges. We have rankings, we have hierarchy, but can you give us a little bit of something positive, just so we have an idea of how we might um, see this working in practice? 
Um, and I think your research project is one example, <laughs> so we could commend you on that. Uh, thank you. Great, thanks, Lisa. Um, I do you want me to go first because this is my part of the presentation. Um, I yeah, well, Eliza, I mean, um, we just started on this, but um, we've got this project going on the uh, the public good role of higher education in in twelve countries at the Centre for Global Higher Education, and we've just employed a new postdoc researcher to work on that project, and we're hoping that that person is going to really help take us forward in our thinking on this in relation to those 12 country cases. But the other, um, the other thing I should mention is that this webinar and the paper we've written for the Tsinghua Journal of Education, which from which this webinar comes, are examples of us putting forward this, the eight principles and how the eight principles might work. Um, we haven't actually taken them from anywhere else. We haven't, there is not a body of literature we're summarizing here we're working on this newly. This is our own idea. So this is new. Um, and so I can't give you lots of examples to show it works or it's a good idea because others say it's a good idea. We're counting on you and others after this webinar to go out and say it's a good idea. It's a call to action. Well, it's a call for, yeah, and discourse and discussion and shared research and, and all those things. It's, yes, it's, it's a manifesto as much as a as much as a um, oh, one of the many roles of tenure is, can be a manifesto as well. Yes. <laughs> Good. Okay. So so with that challenge to us all to, to think about this manifesto and and what's in it. Um, let's take some more questions. So there's still quite a few coming in. So I'm going to ask a couple of people to come forward actually. Um, Song Yang, um, you asked a question about common good, and then followed by Su Young. Um, please, both of you, could you come in? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, well, I think that uh, UNESCO has mentioned that higher, uh, higher, higher education also can be considered as a common good. So I, I just wonder uh, whether there's some connections between the Tianxia and common good. Uh, thanks very much. Great. Thank you, Song Yang. And then um, Su Yung, please. Thank you, Saifat. Thank you, everyone, for your presentation. So I'm going to try hard to articulate my question. So um, I'm sorry if I go back to this question of hierarchy that you have already mentioned. But for me, it's difficult to connect this hierarchy idea with conformity or unique. No, no, no. Hierarchy and um, inclusivity and diversity. Because for me, in my head, hierarchy means that there is a common goal that you want to achieve. That everyone wants to go to this goal. So it assumes oneness and sameness or so belongingness. And um, yeah, how does it how how does it include inclusivity and diversity? That's one question. And this Sheen said that this hierarchy is not static and it can be reordered or redefined, but does it still for me it limits kind of the idea of agency because agency agents try hard to go up upward this hierarchy. In my from my perspective and then does it just means that it's same hierarchy that i mean just a change of order but it's still the same structure then not transformation or the reciprocal transformation of the self and the tongue show or something like that i'm not sure yes please um help me to understand this idea who wants to start um, maybe I could uh, start by picking up the question about the common good. So, um, so in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the concept of the common good and Tianxia, I think there is, a, as Summer has already also mentioned, that um, there is a, a lot of overlap um, and um, uh, resonance between this Chinese way of understanding what is public and private, and also this Tianxia idea with the uh, UNESCO idea of common good. But I think Tianxia idea provides a useful lens to look at different levels of common good. When we talk about common good, we can think about local, local common good, national common good, or even a global common good, which is, um, uh, which is a core concept and core thing in UNESCO's, um, UNESCO's agenda. So I think the Tianxia idea provides a good lens to look at different the relationship between different 
uh, levels of common good and highlight the common good of the world, the common good of the world as a whole, that is that we need to prioritize rather than uh, the common good at, at the national level, which is often the case in the contemporary um, uh, global order. So that is an important lens to look at it and also the relationship um, that um, that uh, different actors can how they can work together jointly to promote the common good and that uh, is related with Tianxia idea. But of course, uh, as Simon also mentioned, there is a democratic element and participatory elements in the common good idea that may need to be further elaborated in Tianxia idea. But as as we have discussed, this is new and we are starting on this. There is a lot to work on. Great. Um, I, I would love to get the last three questions in, so I'm going to ask each of the, the, the speakers if they would quickly summarize their questions, and then we have a chance for a final wrap up. So um, I'm going to ask Sharon J. Ding and Laurie Lee Wallace. So Sharon, do you want to start, please? Sharon, have we lost you? Um, you asked about the common public good and um, neoliberal ideology. I, I think if we're not here, then I think we'll have to go on. Um, Jay Ding, please. Hi, uh, I'm really honored to have a chance to explain my question. Well, actually, I think uh, that it's really a con great concept. Well, my question is about the governance in the Tianxia system. And I think, uh, do you think it needs the compulsory rules or ethic codes in this system? in this system and who would be responsible for making the use or codes uh, if, I mean, uh, in, as it's still a kind of system, so it still needs governance. So how would you think about that? Mm. Yeah. Okay, great. And um, would you like to come in also, um, Laurie, Laurie Lee? Yeah, hi, thank you so much. Um, this is such an incredible presentation. I'm so grateful to be a part of this today. I was, I, I'm really inspired by this. You know, I, my, my research specialty is international pedagogy and performing arts. And as I'm looking at these eight core values, I'm thinking, gosh, you know, you said it, it, it works really well with the sciences. It seems like it would work very, very well with the performing arts as well. And I'm thinking, um, you know, when I teach, Tai Chi Chuan to my actors or yoga to dancers. I'm wondering if that's sort of this principle in action um, or, or if I'm just kind of reaching there. Thank you, that's, that's helpful, Lily. Really. And then I, I actually am gonna reprise um, Sharon's question. She hasn't got a speaker. She asked a similar point about how you got to your eight core values. And she also asked about the relationship between Xiaxia and um, for the public good notion, um, um, which is which she sort of suggests also is, is has a comparator. So I'll leave you the, with those thoughts and questions, please. Who wants to go? Do you want to start again, Lily? Yes. Um, so in terms of the question about governance, so there has been a lot of discussion in in the scholarship of Tianxia, and one strand is, uh, for example, the, um, the the scholar named Zhao Tingyang. His argument is that we need a global government to um, to have this uh, to really implement this governance of Tianxia at the global level, but which is not um, is not really uh, realistic in the contemporary era. If we look at the UN, it's not actually what. Um, is imagined in the Tianxia system as a global government. government. Perhaps the EU is more, uh, is closer to that sort of, um, sort of format of government, but it's at a regional level and it's not likely to have that in the global level. But in uh, having said that, I think the important thing is that the voluntary um, participation of all parts of um, different players, different agencies, institutions all across the world, that uh, one, when the um, ontological imagining of the world changes, then when people agree with, with, with on a few um, values and ethics and the virtues, then there is a possibility of having voluntary and joint um, contribution to make uh, this world order more like a Tianxia, more closer to the Tianxia imagining of the world. 
Thank you very much, Lily. Perhaps I'll pick up on some of the other questions and then Simon can have the final concluding thoughts. So in terms of the questions, Soyang's questions about hierarchies and agency, that's a really good question, Soyang. I think we're seeing both the horizontal hierarchies and also the, uh, sorry, the horizontal horizontal diversity and vertical <laughs> vertical hierarchies. And um, in my view, those two can coexist um, in higher education space. And then in terms of the agency, uh, my point of view is that the agency can be exercised not only to uh, raise, one's, raise one's position within the hierarchy, but also to change the hierarchy, or change the existence of the hierarchies. And as you mentioned, the mobility of like students or the mobility of uh, faculty can also be part of the process of making the collective change to, to this. And in terms of uh, Laurie's question about the arts, definitely, I think this is a really good point. I think when thinking about the Ping Xiang higher education, we're really thinking about all types of institutions, all types of knowledge and all types of practices. So in science, it refers not only to so-called natural sciences, but also lots of like all variety of knowledge. And also in terms of the manifesto, it's not something that is decided by the authors of the paper, uh, but it's like, it's a collective, of discussion and, and, and it's something that, that is to be discussed as we're having today. And thank you very much for all the discussions. I think I'll have to have read them once again after the webinar um, in much details <laughs> later, yeah. Yeah, it's fabulous contributions in the chat and fabulous comments from David as well have added to considerably to this, this webinar. I'm going to quickly respond to three things I think for Sayong. Um, conformity um, problem. Uh, first I'd say that commonness and diversity um, always coexist. You know what things we do together in common the same way and the points of diversity um, always always coexist. It's only when you make them into absolutes either you know commonness or diversity that that there seems to be a contradiction. So I think it becomes more a sort of practical matter of how, you know, the scope for diversity is configured in relation to common systems or common values. Um, but common values should support the scope for diversity, which is one of the ways in which they can be positively brought together. On the question of, of hierarchy and agency, which Shin's also commented on, um, I mean, it depends what kind of hierarchy we're talking about. I mean, there's always unevenness, you know, it's, it's part of the natural human worlds. Um, you know, for example, some are ahead in their thinking sometimes. Even some cultures have a better understanding of something like, say, the ecosystem than other cultures have. Um, sometimes an Id one idea is better than another in the sense that it's more enlightening or it's, you know, takes us into a new territory, whereas the other Id idea doesn't. You know, we, we do make these valuations, which you could call a hierarchical, you know, because they're as they involve recognition of unevenness, even codification of it. I think that where hierarchy becomes an issue or a problem is where it suppresses the scope for self-determining agency. So that, uh, you know, when, when, when hierarchy stops someone from having a view or even reflecting on things in, the, in their inner self and, and, and stops them from um, being able to carry out their activities, uh, then, you know, that raises questions. But on the other hand, as your own research shows, you know, people can choose to conform. You know, that it's, a, it's an agentic choice. And often conformity is a good idea. Like we respect the way this webinar is running. Otherwise we couldn't have a webinar. If we started yelling at each other or speaking out of turn, it would break down. So conformity is something we often choose to exercise. It's an agentically strong rather than weak thing to do. So I think we have to, you know, get it down to specific cases when we're looking at this problem and ask, is the, the, the role of hierarchy here suppressing a scope for agency? You know, is it like adding a structural in, incubus or burden on top of the agent that prevents the agent from flourishing as an agent? Then we've got an issue, but often it doesn't. Um, on Ji Jing's um, very good point, um, I think that in relation to higher education and knowledge, we can develop um, successful international or global bodies you know points of of, uh, of communion where we um where we manage 
issues related to how the relational order should function. Actually, universities are pretty good at this. There's quite a lot of international um, forums and bodies in the university world, like International Association of Universities, where a lot of, if you like, um, of establishment of common language and values is going on. And those bodies play quite a good role. Um, so I think there's, there's considerable potential in our sector to establish voluntary bodies, which at global level operating not you know, above or on top or containing national work, but operating alongside national conversations, but in a way which everyone can be comfortable about and agree with. Lastly, on Sharon's point, um, the public good concept only gets us so far because basically it's, it's out of the market economics tradition. And it says public good is what is something which we can't produce in a market. That would be private good. Uh, and we only uh, fund and support public good production in higher education and research where there's market failure. Uh, in other words, public good is, is a, if you like, the residual or, or, um, or differentiated and um, sort of, ex or I won't say not external, but on the edge or on the fringes of the core economy, which is the market economy. It's, uh, it's secondary to the market economy. It's an externality in economic terms. It's a spillover from market production. It's what we do because we can't do it any other way. But if we could, we'd, we'd run it as a profitable market. So, I mean, the public good is marginalized in this tradition, in this Western economic tradition. The common good idea or the Chanciara idea make the relational setting the, the core question and all of the other activities are contained in it and relate to it. Um, so that the way we order the whole of society or the world then becomes um, primary rather than seeing the collective benefit as some kind of spillover from what the, the real activity, which is the exchange of private um, 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 economic um, uh, ambition in the market. Great. Um, we have come to the end. We, 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 we've had so much to think about here at a time of Grim geopolitics, um, Shin, Lily, and Simon have offered us um, a, a vision for a, a better future. Um, we might not all be one family yet, but certainly CG family, thank you all very much for coming and offering your thoughts and questions. Please keep this conversation going. Um, I'm sure you'll hear more from, the, from all three of you very soon. Please come to our conference in May. The registration is now open, but also next week, as usual, um, our webinars continue, and on Tuesday, it's um, about the, the transformation of Times Higher from a paper to a data analytics company. Um, thank you all again, and see you very soon. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.